Anybody who ever dared to say that is, is over there in a padded cell someplace. I never met anybody in my life that said, I'm Jesus Christ. Yet he said, many shall come in my name, saying, lo, here is Christ. And he warned his disciples, he warned his believers, his little sheep. He said, don't you go after him. Don't you go after him. Don't you be deceived, he said. Don't you be misled. And I'll tell you what that verse means to me. In the Christian world around me, every day I meet some human being who says he is Christ to me. Some human being who wants to tell me God's will for my life. Some human being who wants to carry my burden. Some human being who will pray for me. Some human being who says you can lean on me and trust me. Some human being who says I'll help you. Some human being who says I love you. I'm not saying that some of that is not genuine and some of it is not real, but I want to tell you there are many, many mixed in with the genuine and with the real whose purpose and whose subtle strategy is to become Jesus in my life, to become my Lord. Don't let any man be your Jesus. I was thinking of Moses this morning, you know, when he was up there at the burning bush. This voice came to him out of the fire. And he took his shoes off, and he set them on holy ground. And then he argued with the Lord in his life. And you know what he ended up getting? Because he said, I'm not eloquent. He said, I'm not equipped, I'm not qualified. And as he argued with the Lord, I'll tell you what he got. He got a mediator. He got Aaron to be his spokesman. He settled, I'm sure, for God's second best in his life. He could have had direct communication in the court of Pharaoh. But instead, God spoke to Pharaoh through Moses, through Aaron. I don't want any communication like that. If God can't talk to me out of the burning bush, I don't want to hear him talk to me through you. If God can't raise his voice so that I can hear him, how can I be sure that I'm really hearing him when you speak? I have to know his voice for myself before I will know his voice in you. And I'll tell you, there's nothing but trouble ahead for the man who learns the voice of Jesus through another before he learns it for himself. You with me? You'd be in trouble. Well, let me talk a little bit more about this business of Jesus talking to us, okay? You interested in that? I used to... I had some more rubbish on the wall and it bugged me for a long time because... One of the things was I never could understand, never could figure out whether the devil was talking to me or God was talking to me. And that's really a foolish thing because that really says that I don't trust God and that I don't really believe God can talk to me so that I can hear him and understand him. Many times I've asked him to speak to me and give me wisdom and give me knowledge and give me help and give me understanding and give me comfort or whatever it was I needed. And then just as soon as that comfort or that wisdom or that knowledge or that understanding came, I turned around and gave the praise to the devil. And I said, that's the devil talking to me. So you see, you have to start out by, by really trusting him. And one of the things that used to bother me tremendously was that if, if I didn't seem to hear anything from the Lord... I always thought it was my fault because I'd been taught in the religious world that I have to be on some kind of sacred ground of fellowship before I could really hear the Lord's voice. And if I wasn't just as sanctified as I ought to be, a walking just as holy as I ought to be, that I was going to miss the voice of the Lord. And it used to irritate me because I'd go along and not hear anything from the Lord and I always thought it must be my fault, it must be my fault. I listen, but I don't hear anything. I pray and ask him to talk to me, and then I don't hear anything. And uh, my problem was that lots of times that was true. He didn't say anything. And I was always trying to make him say something when he didn't say anything, uh, but I never had any trouble understanding him when he said something. You agree with that? You remember the story of little Samuel, whose mother Hannah took him to the temple to live? Just a little fellow, just a little guy. Slept and always had it pictured out that he had a little youth bed back in one of the spare bedrooms of the temple. And he had his teddy bear sitting up on his chest of drawers. 
and had his little school book laying on his desk. And he came here to live, to learn about God. Well, it would be many, many years before little Samuel would ever have the privilege of going right into the very holy sanctuary of God and speaking face to face with God like a man speaks to his friend. There was Eli, the priest. That was his privilege. But not little Samuel. God ain't got time to talk to a little boy. And one night when this little boy was asleep, there was a voice. And the voice said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel woke up in the night and he said, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And God talked to him. Isn't that precious? God talked to him. The reason God doesn't talk to some of us is because it's too humiliating to be little boys. Too humiliating to admit we don't know anything. Too humiliating to say, Lord, I'm just a little boy. You can talk to me like you talked to Samuel. You can speak to me like you spoke to Paul. You can speak to me like you spoke to Ananias and said, Ananias, this is Jesus talking. Go down to Damascus and give a message to Paul for me. You can talk to me, Lord. And Lord, I want you to be real like this to me. But I had to learn some things about the way he talks to me. One of them was that there's lots of times he doesn't say anything, and I should never try to force him to talk when he don't want to. And I found out that he just doesn't talk all the time. My friends talk all the time. My neighbors talk all the time. Most Christians I know talk all the time. Talk, 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 talk. They talk about what they did or what they're going to do or what they're doing now. He doesn't talk like that all the time. In fact, one of the reasons is that he doesn't, he doesn't have any trouble with the vocabulary. He doesn't waste a lot of words. It doesn't take him an hour to say what he can say in two sentences. I have this problem, but he never does. He speaks short, direct, very clearly, enunciates very clearly. His voice is so precious. It's so, so real and so tender because it never takes place up here. It takes place way deep down inside the little man. There's just some quiet, velvet, soft, sweet assurance there that this is him talking and I hear him. I never look back and say, was it you really, Lord, or not? Whenever he speaks, I hear him and I know what he says. My big problem, I repeat, is in trying to make him say something when he hadn't said anything. You remember my experience I told you about here a year ago when I was on a little bike trip and my mind got to give me a lot of hassle over the fact that I wasn't reading the Bible and I wasn't praying. There I was laying on the bed in the motel reading the paper. And you remember how I got into a big argument with my mind and, and uh, the devil told me, why, this is unspiritual, this is terrible, terrible. Why, you ought not to be out here just reading the paper, getting ready to watch TV. You ought to be reading and studying the Scriptures and you ought to be praying, you ought to be thinking spiritual things. And I just got real honest and I said, Lord, I'm going to tell you face to face why I'm not reading the Bible, why I'm not praying. And the answer is simply, I don't want to. Now, Lord, I don't know how to explain that to you, but I just don't want to. I'm tired, and my mind's tired, and my heart's tired, and my body's tired, and I just don't feel like it. And he said, does that mean that you don't want me to talk to you? Oh, no, Lord. Hey, you're talking about something else now. I want to hear from you any time you want to say anything to me. And, Lord, I want to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay right here and read the paper. And I'm going to watch television. If you've got anything to say to me, you raise your voice and say it. And I'll tell you one thing. I'll make a record for history and shut the television off and laying the paper down. Because I want to hear anything you've got to say any time of day or night. You can wake me up in the middle of the night and talk to me if you want to. Because I'll hear. Whenever you say, I have somewhat to say to thee, you will hear this from me, Lord. Say on. And until I hear from you, I'll assume that you don't have anything to say. And I went around and read my paper. And I read the paper and I watched TV and I went to sleep and I didn't hear a word one from him. But I didn't lay there all night wondering what he said because he hadn't said anything. 
I got up the next morning. I hadn't heard anything from him. I hadn't heard anything by the time breakfast was over. I got on my motorcycle and started down the road, and I hadn't heard word one. I ate my lunch, and I still didn't hear anything. And along about one or two o'clock in the afternoon, do you know what he did? He raised his voice, and he said, Hey, you, I'm talking to you now. Down in my heart, he began to flood my heart with some of the precious realities of himself and of his truth. So much so, I had to stop my bike and get off and go buy a notebook and a pencil and sit down and begin to write them down. Stupid thing to do. Because after I got them all wrote down in my notebook, he said to me, Hey, you got them in your notebook, have you? Where were they an hour ago? I said, Lord, it was in you. He said, and I'm in you. Your notebook's in you, friend. Did you know that? Your notebook's in you. Don't let his silence scare you. He'll be back. If he didn't say anything to you today, he'll be back. He'll not leave you. He's waiting for the right season to talk to you. There's a few more experiences maybe you need before he can talk to you on the next subject that's on his heart. Maybe there's some light he's already given you. He's waiting for you to walk in before he starts talking anymore. He don't waste any words. Maybe there's some truth he's waiting for you to grasp in the experiences of life before he reveals any more of it to you. And I'll tell you this much, that anything you need to know at any time of day or night, he'll tell you. You can trust him to do that. And if you don't need this information, you won't get it. But if you need it, you'll have it. Again, let me repeat this because it's precious to me. I went to bed one night wondering how in this world I was going to get the information I needed about the circumstances of my life. I knew people had that information, but they wouldn't give it to me. And I knew that I needed to know the truth. And frustrated, I just said to the Lord one night before I went to sleep, Lord, what am I going to do? And he said, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And any light you need for your life, you trust me, little sheep. I, your light, will give it to you. If you need to know anything about anybody, I'll tell it to you. If you need to discover anything you haven't discovered, I'll reveal it to you. Did I not tell Paul that 40 men were going to take his life? If 40 men decide to take your life and I decide that you should live, I'll warn you and I'll put you in a basket and let you over the wall and I'll get you clean out of that place. You just relax and go right on doing whatever it is you're doing. I'm looking after you and if you need to know anything, I'll tell you about it. Now remember that verse in Philippians where it says, let us be like-minded, brethren, if any of us be otherwise. Never mind, Paul says, God will reveal it to him. In a wonderful trusting like that, just say, Lord, <laughs> I ain't going to worry about anything anymore. If I need to know anything, you'll tell me. If I need to be anything, you'll make me what I need to be. If I need to go any place, you'll force me. If I need to say anything, I won't be able to help myself. If I need to think anything, you'll put it in my mind. If I need to feel anything, you'll put it in my heart. But this much for sure, Lord, you're going to be real to me, or I just don't want to go on with this thing anymore. I want you to be real to me. You say, well, the Lord talks to me, but I can't remember all He says. Oh, yes, you can. You can remember everything he ever said to you because the Holy Spirit is in you to bring to your remembrance whatever he said to you. You hear this message this morning, maybe you'll only be able to retain just a little bit of it. Maybe you'll go out of here and you'll say, I don't know what all the message was about, but I know one thing for sure. That's what the Lord said to you, brother. He may have said something else to somebody else. But that's what he said to you. And I'll tell you what you really hear from the Lord. It's what becomes real in your life. It's what becomes true in your heart. It's what's made a fact in your experience. You didn't apply it to your life. He applied it to your life because he changed your heart about this truth. That's what the Lord says to you. He's been saying lots of things to you. And you've just missed the joy of realizing 
that it was the precious voice of the Lord Jesus talking to you. Trust him. When you ask him for wisdom and you get an idea that you never had before, a thought, a solution that never occurred to you before you got to him and asked him, don't immediately say the flesh gave me that and don't immediately say the devil gave me that. You remember how I told you he woke me up in the middle of the night not long ago and rebuked me for that? He said, if you asked me for a, a fish, would I give you a serpent? If you asked me for bread, would I give you a stone? You asked me last night before you went to sleep for wisdom. You asked me to give you some help in your problems. You asked me to tell you what you needed to know. You got up this morning, you had ideas you never thought of before. And you immediately turned around and said, that was the flesh and that was the devil. And you ignored everything I said to you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore until you start listening to what I tell you. And that, believe it or not, is what I speak about when I talk about uh, following your heart. Enoch got up in the morning and he, he believed God was real. I've told you how Enoch in the, Old, in the New Testament was praised by the writer of the book of Hebrews as being a man who pleased God. And when I delved into that to find out what it was about Enoch that pleased God, when all I could find was that he walked with God, I discovered that the very next verse says that, you know, that if you've got to believe that God is. And you've got to believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that was a little P.S. about Enoch. It was saying that Enoch was a man who believed in the reality of God and believed that if he would diligently seek him and his reality, that that God would reward him and the reward he rewarded Enoch with, pardon my grammar, was walking with him. Enoch lived in a time when other men worshipped God, but Enoch walked with him. He lived in a time where men were all bowed down making little images and building stone altars and killing animals, and Enoch walked hand in hand, heart to heart, face to face with God. Others knew about God, and Enoch knew him. Others hoped for the day when they would go into the great tabernacle of heaven and walk with him. Enoch walked with him every day of his life. One of the simplest lessons I've learned in walking one-on-one -on -one with Jesus is this. Oh, brethren, I hope this will be some practical help to you. Start every day getting the order straight with you. Start every day by just having a little talk with Jesus. Say it out loud to him like this, Lord. I'm not saying this for your benefit. I'm saying it for mine. Help me start this day remembering what a poor, dumb sheep I am. And what a beautiful, wonderful, precious, real, true, and faithful shepherd you are. Lord, help me keep my nose out of every other sheep's business and let you run their lives like I want you to run mine. Lord, help me keep my stupid advice to myself and my mouth shut. Keep me from shaping other sheep's lives, being their shepherd, guiding them and leading them and making them walk like I walk because I think I'm walking the only perfect walk. Lord, get it straight with me this morning that I'm a poor, dumb sheep. And you are my precious shepherd. And I believe in you, Lord. Now remember, remember, Lord, when I walk out the door here this morning, I don't hear too well. Remember, Lord, that I get them bugs up my nostrils and those fly eggs in my ears. And remember, Lord, that I get briars and brambles and remember, Lord, that I get bruised and shook up. And remember, Lord, how stupid I am. Will you remember that I get out there and I lose my way and I wander around in circles? And Lord, you won't forget that I'm a poor dumb sheep today, will you? And if you talk to me and I don't seem to hear you, will you just for me raise your voice a little bit so I can hear you? Because, Lord, I want to hear you. He's never failed to do that. But my heart's like I described. Okay? Try one day recklessly abandoning yourself to the shepherd and just being a poor dumb sheep instead of trying to be the shepherd.
You see, most of us poor sheep are willing to be sheep only as it seems apparent to us that the shepherd's doing the right kind of a job in their life. And as soon as he seems to fail, that is, as soon as he allows things in my life I don't like, I say, okay, enough of this business. Me, shepherd, now. You, sheep. I'm going to take the rod and staff in my hand. I'm going to straighten this thing out. I'm going to lead my life the way I think it ought to be led. Now, don't do that. Just remember every morning what a poor, dumb, stupid sheep you are. And then you follow him. Don't get your eyes on John. Don't get your eyes on James. Don't get your eyes on Paul. Don't get your eyes on Herb. Don't get your eyes on Henry. Don't get your eyes on anybody. Keep your eyes on the face of the shepherd, and you'll never go wrong. Somebody said the other day that they once believed in this certain Christian they were talking to me about, and they said, but I had a terrible, terrible disappointment and disillusionment. That Christian made me to stumble. I said, brother, if you stumbled, it was because you had your eyes on a man instead of on Jesus. There ain't nobody can stumble when they're looking at Jesus. And if you think I'm wrong about that, the first man you think makes you stumble, you go look at his hands and see if there's any wounds in it. And as long as there ain't no wounds in it, you don't have any trouble. The man with the wounds in his hands will never let you down. He's the good shepherd. <laughs> he carries about his own identification. You don't have to be deceived, and you won't need to be unless you want to be. So, just follow him. And i got to share a couple more things with you. One of the first lessons he tried to teach me in my life was about 23 years ago. I started off in my mind to do a certain thing in Christian life. I thought I was going to be a missionary. This had been pawned off on me by men who knew the will of God for my life, who told me what I had to do to be pleasing to God, who told me how I had to walk and where I had to walk it, and exactly what I had to do while I was walking there. They laid my whole life out for me and told me, now this is the pattern, this is the pattern, this is the pattern. And I tried very diligently to get with it because I did want to please the Lord and I didn't want to do anything He wanted me to do and be anything He wanted me to be. I was serious about that. And so accepting the counsel of man as the counsel of God, I immediately set out to do this thing. But there was just one thing I couldn't get done. I could not get my heart to cooperate with my feet. My feet was moving one direction, but my heart was balking. And it kept saying, not so, not so, not so. And the closer it came to the time for me to go for good, the stronger that voice got down inside and it said, don't go, don't go. And my mind answered back, but you have to, you have to. The people said, go. The church said go. The pastor said go. The Great Commission says go. The doctrine of the church says go. You will have to go. But this voice persisted, and down in my heart it kept saying, But I, Jesus, your Lord, say don't go. And I'm head of this church, and I am the groom, and you are my bride, and I'm telling you, you can't go. I won't let you go. i got something else for you to do. And if he had told me right on the spot what it was, oh, I said, now I understand. Well, how simple can you be? Of course, sure, I see it. Lord, you got a better plan for it. No, remember my message on the will of God. He didn't reveal any master plan to me. He said, I've got something else for you to do, but it's my business to know and yours to find out. You have to walk with faith with me. You just have to do what I'm now telling you to do, and what I'm now telling you to do is say no. Ten miles, ten miles from the Canadian border, I made a U-turn in the road, and I started back, and I stopped in every state, and I said, Lord, if you want me here, I'll stay here. If you want me here, I'll stay here. And he never said a word. And I came all the way back into West Virginia, 90 miles from Parkersburg. I stopped at this little town in the mountains, 
where I had once lived. And I took a walk by myself out in the woods, and I sat down under a big red oak tree where I'd spent some time squirrel hunting. And the tears were coming fast and furious, because in two or three hours from that time, I had to face the scorn of all my Christian friends, the rebuke of all of those men who had counseled me. I had to face the wrath of the mystery of iniquity who would deal severely with a man who would not buckle down and knuckle down to what they wanted. I said, Lord, I'm sitting here crying because I'm going to lose every friend I got and all the Christian fellowship I ever knew, and my name is going to be mud in the Christian world, and I'm going to be a nothing and a nobody and a castaway from this day forever and ever and ever. I'm going to be 4F in your army starting now. And here's what he said in my heart, and it made a 23-year impression on me, and I've never lost it. He said, you get up and go, and don't you ever apologize to any human being on this earth for doing my will. I'm your Lord. When you start apologizing, he said, you're trying to justify yourself like the Pharisees. You're wanting their acceptance rather than mine. Their approval instead of mine. Their blessing instead of mine. You have my blessing. You go in peace. There won't be anybody but me and you know that you've done what I want you to do. But there'll be a time when they'll know you trust me. So don't make any apologies. You walk in the light that you believe Jesus has given you. You walk in the truth as the truth has been made known to you. And don't let anybody make you walk in the light that they have or force the truth on you that they believe themselves to have. You walk in the light he's given you. And don't you hinder any man from walking in the light Jesus has given him. Because Jesus gives a unique revelation of himself to every human being because each of us are unique. I can't walk in your light and you can't walk in mine. I can't believe your truth and you can't believe mine just like you believe it and just like I believe it. This is an individual, personal, intimate walk. It's me and my bridegroom. And he tells me lots of things in secret I can't tell you. And he shares lots of things with me I can't share with you. You can walk in a part of my walk, but not some of it all. Oh, my brethren, this is a personal, intimate walk between myself and my bridegroom. And just like that day 23 years ago when he said, Nobody but you and I will know, he made me say, Lord, through my tears, you're enough. If you know, I can take whatever they heap on me. If you know, I can take whatever they put on me. And hey, I took it. They beat me badly about the head and shoulders. They defamed me. They rebuked me. They criticized me, condemned me, accused me, and damned me. I lost the earthly fellowship of my own earthly brother over it. I lost other fellowship and other members of my family. But hey, I want to tell you one thing I got out of it. I got the reality of Jesus' fellowship out of it. And I've got the scars in my body for it. He's been teaching me that down through the years of life, and he's still teaching me now. Another thing I want to tell you before we close is don't, uh, don't try to uh, chart the course. Okay, that's again back to this shepherd and sheep business. And if you try to track the Lord, you will end up like a bloodhound who loses the scent. Because that's the word Paul uses in Romans 11 when he says, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? You can't seek after the Lord and find him. Not like that. Why his ways are too far above your ways. He used a word in the Greek that tells me that if you try to track the Lord's ways, you'll be like a bloodhound that loses the scent because his understanding is so far beyond yours and his ways are so far beyond your understanding that the reason it's that way is that he wants you to trust him, not understand him. <laughs> he wants you to love him, 
not have to justify everything he does in your life to your reason. He wants you to just say, take hold my hand, little boy. It's going to be me and you against the world. I know you're going to think we're going the wrong way. You're going to think we're lost a couple of times. And you're going to think I'm dragging you through some unnecessary hard country. But I promise you when we get where we're going, you'll be glad for every step. And you'll see divine reason and holy understanding in everything I've allowed in your life for your good and my glory. When I left the church business back in 1964, I had been totally frustrated over how to tell a brother from a false brother, how to tell a tear from a wheat. Because when the showdown came and we had to shoot out at the OK Corral, some of the men I'd really counted on and leaned on, and I thought were my brothers, weren't there when the heat got on. Remember? And I was confused and perplexed, and I said, Lord, I was sure about this one and sure about that one, and I see now how wrong I was. And he said, now learn the lesson. You've had the pain of it. And I said, what's the lesson, Lord? Now never forget this, he said. Let me pick them. Let me pick them. You just preach me. You just reveal me among the heathen, (laughs) and I'll pick them. So you let him pick your course, too. (laughs) Okay. You let him chart the course, he knows how to do it. I can't track his ways. But you know, one of the things that's precious to me is he gave me an understanding of my life one time by talking to me about a jigsaw puzzle. I shared this with some of and we'll share with you again this morning. You know, when I was at home, uh, we used to have a jigsaw puzzle going almost all the time, didn't we, Mother? On the dining room table, and everybody came through the dining room, stopped and tried to put a piece on it. And, of course, back in the Depression, there wasn't much of anything else to do except eat soup, beans, and cornbread and work jigsaw puzzles. But uh, after you learned to work those simple ones, you graduated to where they were a little more complicated. And uh, one day I was trying to figure out my life, and the Lord said, Now, you remember those jigsaw puzzles you used to work? And I said, Yes. He said, I want to talk to you about your life. You see, when you started out in life, little sheep, it was like a big jigsaw puzzle, but it was, it was a big bunny rabbit. And there was only eight pieces in the whole puzzle. And it didn't take you hardly any time at all to put it all together. And then as life went on, you graduated to those 25-piece puzzles. And that was maybe a map of the United States. And that wasn't too hard once you got the general outline worked out. And you got to be able to do that with your eyes closed. Then you graduated those 200-piece puzzles. And the pieces got just a little smaller, and the pattern got a little more complicated. He said, then you graduated to those 500-piece, and then those 1,000-piece puzzles. And I said, yes, Lord, and you don't need to tell me anymore, because I know where I am. He said, where are you? And I said, at the present time, I'm working a 10,000-piece puzzle. It's all white. It's a snow scene. It's round. Only they never told me that. And I've been struggling with it for months and months, and I just noticed on the box in fine print that it says pieces may be irregular, some may be missing. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, Lord, I can't do anything but trust you. And the other day... He added a little more to my puzzle philosophy, and he just spoke to me because I was having a terrible time being submitted to where I was and what I was at that moment. And he said, look, little boy, you've gone back to trying to figure the picture out again. You're still trying to fit the border together so you can see where you're going. You're still trying to decide whether it's a water or a landscape. You're still trying to decide whether this blue is sea or sky. Here's what I want you to do. Concentrate on the peace called today. Just accept this peace. Trust me that it is a part of the overall picture. Trust me that when it's in its proper place, you'll be able to see more of the overall picture than you could see yesterday. And trust me that when that last piece is put into place, 
it will be a picture of beauty because I designed it and there's not a piece missing. And not a piece is irregular no matter how much you may judge them to be in each day of your life. And he repeated to me what he had often told me, the will of God for your life is to submit to where you are and who you are and why you're there for this moment of time. Here's a good recipe for the day. Start tomorrow morning by accepting this fact. This is the day the Lord hath made. He's already made it. Not this is the day the Lord is going to make a moment at a time. This is the day the Lord has already made. Since he made it, he put some thought into it. Since he made it, he designed it the way he wanted it for my good and his glory. So this is the day the Lord hath made. Now all you have to do today is rejoice in it. <laughs> and along about noon, you'll need some help, so I'm going to tell you what to say about noon. <laughs> About noontime, when you're about to come apart at the seams and you're saying, How can this be the day that the Lord made? You look up like Jesus did in the midst of his most turbulent day, and he said, Father, I thank thee. I thank thee. I thank you, Father, because it pleases you that things are as they are. Even so, Father, for it hath seemed good unto thee. That's a way of saying, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. It means, Lord, I don't understand anything this day has given me. I can't see where it fits into the picture, and I can't see any good in it, but I know one thing, Lord. It's as you allowed it to be. It has seemed good in thy sight. Help me now just to trust you. And when the end of the day comes, before you go to sleep, just say, Lord... I'm just going to go to sleep now and rest in the fact that I'm your concern, your special care. You're going to take care of all the problems for me. You're going to do all the worrying for me. And you're going to come along behind me today with goodness and mercy. And you're going to put this piece in my puzzle while I sleep. And when I get up in the morning, I'll see just a little more clearly what the pattern's all about and perhaps where we're going from here. I have much more I'd like to say to you, but I will have to wait for another time. But hear this last thing. When you walk one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, don't ever accuse him of doing anything to you. When things come along you don't like, don't say, what is Jesus doing to me? And... Let me refine that a little bit. Don't say, what is Jesus doing through me? And let me refine it a little more. Don't say, what is Jesus doing in me? Let me bring it down to this. Say, what is Jesus doing for me? I was taught by the church business that I was just like an old... Uh, I was just a tool hung up in Jesus' carpenter shop, you know. You ever hear that? Pardon me, I always use a bad word. You ever hear that stuff? Uh, each of us are tools hanging in the Galileans' carpenter shop. Some of us are saws. Well, I know that because I've known a lot of them people who were all rips. <laughs> and some of us were hammers. I believe that because I've been beat on them by several. Some of us were screwdrivers. I believe that because some of the screwiest people I know are Christians. You ever hear this old stuff? We're all tools in the Galileans carpenter shop. And I was taught this by the church business. You just hang on a nail in the carpenter shop until the carpenter gets ready to use you. And then he jerks you off the wall and he beats and pounds and rips and saws and chisels with you. Hangs you back up on the shelf. Bends you all out of shape and knocks big chips out of you. Gives you a headache. And he says, don't worry about it. I'm using you for my glory. I don't like to be used. Do you? He never uses me. Oh, sometimes he does use me. 
He uses me to bless you. And sometimes he does do something in me because I see the lasting effects. And sometimes he does do something to me and through me. But, oh, my brethren, if you lose this perspective, you've lost it all. Every one of those things he has done for me. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> I'm his blessed bride, and he's my groom. And everything he does, he does for me. I used to think that whatever he did in me and through me and to me, he did to glorify himself in the eyes of the world. And he said to me one day, I would rather be glorified in your eyes than in the eyes of the whole world because you're my bride. Do you understand that principle? Jesus wants to be a man in my eyes first before he wants to be a man in anybody's eyes. He wants me to worship and love him and adore him and praise him before he wants anybody else outside my life to do it. I'm his. He bought me with his blood and paid for me with the dissension of his own soul to hell. And I want to tell you something. There isn't any woman on this earth that Jesus would rather impress like me. So he does what he does for me. <laughs> and it's as I praise him and thank him and worship him and adore him and manifest my love to him, that's when he's glorified in the eyes of the world. But what glorifies him is my love affair with Jesus and his love affair with me. They step back and they say, my, doesn't he love her? And they say, my, doesn't she love him? And they marvel and something's awakened inside of them for the same kind of love affair with Jesus. And miracle of all, they find it. Isn't that precious? Yes. I'm more important to him than the work I do for him. I'm more important to him than the things I say for him. I'm more important to him than being where he wants me to be. I'm important to him. I'm precious to him. One day when I got tired and I said, Lord, I don't know how I can keep up with all this. It's too much. How can you be spread so thin and still make it? And he said to me, listen, I'm not interested in the cassette tapes. I'm not interested in the books. I'm not interested in the union hall. I'm not interested in passing out tracts. I'm not interested in any of the things that you do for me. I'm interested in you. You're more precious to me than all these things. I can hire angels to pass out tracts and make cassette tapes. But you're my bride. You wear yourself out and you die. And when you die, I die. Because if you die today, the whole sphere of influence in this world where I have been present will be closed forever. And he said, you are where you are, that I might be there. I said, Lord, that makes it worthwhile. He said, I'm interested in you first, not your work. I'm interested in the work after I'm interested in you. And so even in the work, I'm doing something for you. Let's walk one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. I hope this message will help you. Has it helped you? Let us pray. Father, thank you for your love and concern for us. Thank you for Jesus. He's so precious and real and true. Thank you for allowing him to talk to us and us for being able to hear him. Make us more attentive to his voice. Help us to remember, Father, that he will never leave us nor forsake us and even if we have willfully turned our ears away from him. If it endangers our health, our welfare, and our lives, he will raise his voice so we can hear him. Because he's our shepherd and we're the sheep. He's our bridegroom and we're the bride. He's our blessed Lord. He's our blessed head and Savior. Help us just to let him be head of our house. And help us just to be submitted to him and have our desires unto him. And know that whatever you want in our life, our blessed husband will define for us and interpret for us. 
Help us just to rest in this blessed, sweet, precious walk with Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.